This is Too Close to Home, the video series in which we dig up creepy, mysterious, and unexplained stories from our Patreon's hometowns. Are you curious about the eerie events that may have happened in your hometown? If so, you want to join our Too Close to Home video tier. Our team of talented researchers will dig up haunted tales, creepy encounters, UFO sightings, and true crime events within a 20 plus mile radius of your area. Once we gather all the information, we'll then narrate the findings in a Too Close to Home video, giving you a chance to explore the darker side of your town. So why wait? Join the Too Close to Home video tier membership and delve into the chilling history of your own backyard. In this episode, we'll be looking at the hometowns of Morgan, Naresh, Dakota, Dan Holmes, and Zoe. You five lucky folks are in for some truly mind-blowing stories, now to be heard by the rest of the world. And if you haven't already done so, this is my personal request to all five of you to hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Morgan, Perth, Western Australia. Perth is the most isolated city in the world. It is completely surrounded by the Australian outback on one side and the Indian Ocean on the other. As well as being an area of outstanding natural beauty, it has some of the most important cultural sites in Australia. As the capital city of Western Australia, Perth is chock full of spine chilling events throughout its deeply fascinating history. And our patron Morgan is lucky enough to live there However, amidst all of its folklore and fascinating affairs, is one murder case that stands out from all the rest. And it's not because of the unsolved nature one usually associates murder mysteries with, but rather its cryptic, cold-blooded lack of a motive that turns an otherwise random homicide into a bizarre, eerie enigma. It all started one boisterous night in 2004. It was a Wednesday evening, and the recent Perth transplant 19-year-old Rebecca Ryle wanted to hang out with her new friends at a nearby pub. Up until that point, the Ryle family's transition from England to the northern Perth suburb of Bolton had gone swimmingly. They loved the change from grey skies to sunshine, but had no idea the storm clouds looming on the horizon would be darker than anything seen before in their old Harwood home. On the night in question, the up-and-coming nursing student was homesick and needed time away to distract herself from the loneliness. She sought out the friends she'd made in the last six months and grabbed a few drinks at the boat, a tavern at the local harbour. One of the patrons that night just so happened to be an acquaintance of Rebecca's friends, another 19-year-old English immigrant named James Duggan. Duggan was the furthest from Rebecca's type, but the two hit it off nonetheless. After a few hours of laughing over drinks, he offered to walk her home and she obliged without hesitation. Less than an hour later, Duggan and Rebecca were again hitting it off, this time at an abandoned park just a block away from her Perth home. It was strategically out of earshot, not a security camera or passerby in sight, and at first it didn't matter, the unlikely pair were kissing in between drags of a single cigarette. But when Duggan started to strangle her, it was obvious it was all part of a nefarious plan. Duggan choked Rebecca Ryle for at least three minutes while the poor nursing student struggled to fight back. After her heart stopped, Duggan tossed her half-naked body aside and ran into the night. He stopped at a local petrol station, inexplicably as if nothing even remotely cruel had just occurred. He bought some food, an adult magazine, and talked with a cashier for nearly an hour. It was obvious Perth had a psychopath on their hands. The following morning, Rebecca's sprinkler-soaked corpse was found in the same park she was murdered in, right next to the local primary school. She was brought in for autopsy with the coroner ruled her death a homicide by strangulation. Detectives were put on the case, and eventually James Duggan was brought to justice. However, even after his conviction, no one ever truly discovered why Duggan killed Rebecca Ryle. Some claim it was unmedicated mental illness, others say it was much darker than that. The Ryle family was in ruins after the cold-blooded murder, and the lack of a motive or explanation was all the more painful. In an even more shocking twist, 
Duggan was given a life sentence with a minimum of 11 years, but has since been released and deported back to the United Kingdom. It has since been reported he now lives in Liverpool, a free man, under the care of relatives. However, he still hasn't explained why he chose to take Rebecca's life that day, and many believe he was released too soon. Fearful, whatever evil consumed him that fateful night in the streets of Perth will make him strike again. Naresh, Queens, New York City Our next story comes from the neighbourhood of Queens, one of the five boroughs in New York City, one of, if not the most famous metropolis in the world. Queens is known for many things, including Flushing Meadows, Kaufman Astoria Studios, and two of the Big Apple's major airports, and is our patron Naresh's hometown. What Queens isn't known for, but should be, is its abundance of centuries-old cemeteries and the grisly history behind them. Along the Jackie Robertson Parkway is a 2.5-mile stretch of land called the Cemetery Belt, a swath of land filled to the brim with dead bodies and foreboding grave markers telling the tales of New York's dead. Many people drive along the Cemetery Belt, never batting an eye, let alone pondering the events that led to such a necrotic property development. It all started in 1847 with the passage of the Rural Cemeteries Act. For the first time in New York's history, businesses could purchase large plots of the countryside to sell grave sites for profit. Church groups and savvy entrepreneurs got in on the fun, and before long, the cemetery belt was open for business. However, starting in 1832 and lasting into 1849, the heart of New York City was struck by a ghastly cholera outbreak. Manhattan's burial locations were quickly filled, and after the outbreak ended, city officials needed somewhere to dump the infected bodies, away from the busy streets. Thus they looked to the cemetery belt, and the disease-ridden corpses found new homes. A similar thing happened when the famous Brooklyn Bridge was built. Old graves were dug up, and in the thick of night, the dead were taken to Queens, without regard for the disturbed spirits. For years, Manhattan displaced bodies from every nook and cranny of the city, and today, the dead outnumber the living by a ratio of 3 to 1 in the borough of Queens. One such mass gravesite is the Macapella Cemetery, found off the cemetery belt in the neighbourhood of Glendale. It makes up just a small fraction of the overall burial grounds, but plays host to maybe the most famous of all the tombs. Built in 1855, it remains to this day the final resting place of the legendary illusionist and escape artist Harry Houdini. In 1926, Houdini was repeatedly punched in the stomach by a student, attempting to thwart the legend that his stomach was made of steel. The punches were so impactful, though, they were said to have ruptured Houdini's appendix, despite science suggesting this was impossible. Regardless, the resulting appendicitis aided in the illusionist's untimely demise, and he was interred at Macpella. In the years since, crowds of visitors stopped by Houdini's grave every year on Halloween, hoping to catch a paranormal sighting of the fabled entertainer. Some say on especially foggy nights, one can see an apparition in handcuffs and shackles break free, running off between the tombstones. Others have reported sights of a shadowy figure cloaked in a straight jacket, peering behind obstacles. In other parts of the cemetery, the abandoned office building ruins are rumoured to be haunted, with unrested spirits cackling behind the dilapidated walls. It was abandoned in the 1980s, but remains to visitors brave enough to face its fearsome ghosts. Dakota, College Station, Texas. Our next chapter takes us to the Brazos Valley of East Central Texas, to the research-centric city of College Station the Lone Star State's 13th largest metropolis. College Station is home to Texas A&M University, research projects galore, and investments by major entities such as NASA and the National Science Foundation, and the hometown of our much-valued patron Dakota. Amidst its academic prowess, however, lies a grim tale of accidental death and decades' worth of haunts that have since started a legacy of the supernatural's presence. Its roots go all the way back to 1959, on a typical Saturday morning in mid-November. At Texas A&M's Animal Industries building, the meat locker room foreman, Roy Sims, 
was preparing a selection of pork in the basement's laboratory. It had long been his daily routine, dating back 11 years. Unfortunately, he had no idea it would ultimately be his last time. Just after 8am, Sims' assistant left for a few moments to receive a weather report on the radio, just as he prepared to cut a slab of bacon. As Sims sliced towards himself, he lost control of the knife and cut his leg open very close to the groin. His femoral artery was split open and he proceeded to bleed out. In a last ditch effort to survive, the foreman dragged himself to the freight elevator, hoping to lift himself where help could be called. By then though, too much blood had been lost. When the assistant returned, it was too late. Sims was pronounced dead by 8.15. While the old animal laboratory has since been renovated into an office floor, there have been plenty of paranormal sightings heard by the students and employees of Texas A&M. The wall where the freight elevator was located often sees bizarre looking objects moving up and down the facade. In this short clip posted in 2013, an unlucky visitor believed they captured an apparition of sorts in the corner of the room. However, with the poor quality of the footage, it's impossible to discern what exactly the object is if there is one at all. Other paranormal activities include the presence of unnatural sounds echoing through the empty hallways at night. The screams of no one in particular have been heard by passing students, as well as random doors slamming shut or the pitter-patter of footprints when the upper floors are otherwise empty. The supernatural feelings saturating the old campus relic are enough to spook the graveyard custodial staff as well. Workers assigned to the building don't always last more than a month, with some so fearful they quit the job on the spot without notice, never to be heard from again. One of the building managers, Dr. Gary Smith, came up with a plan to curb poltergeist activity all the way back in 1983, when a custodian named Henry Turner revealed the elevator being at the top floor led to an increase in things being thrown around the room. Dr. Smith allowed Turner to keep the elevator open at the basement level. After the gentleman's agreement, the meat lab's tools were undisturbed henceforth. The keeping of the elevator opening at the bottom floor is a custom kept going by custodians to this day. The place where Sims' accident occurred is now a men's bathroom, where the rusty hooks that held slaughtered cattle still hang from the ceiling. The drains were blood pooled into the ground still at the feet of anyone with enough courage to face the paranormal in College Station. Dan Holmes, Wirral, Merseyside, England Our penultimate tales traverses the Atlantic and takes us to the sleepy suburbs of Wirral, a metropolitan borough of Merseyside in England and the hometown of our much-valued Patreon Dan. It borders the city of Liverpool, known for its nature reserves and family-friendly neighbourhoods. Despite its 300,000 plus population, it's considered a small town compared to the sprawling cities nearby. Wirral hasn't always been a picturesque postcard of a quiet, reserved suburb though. Back in the 1980s, its southern settlement, Heswell, played host to the infamous murder investigation called The Beauty in the Bath. A one-time cold case, the beauty in the bath has since come under scrutiny as a solved, yet still unsolved killing. A case with more questions than answers in the 25 years since it was considered closed. It all started with the discovery of 50-year-old Cynthia Bolshaw, a jewellery salesman and single mother who lived on Buffs Lane in Heswell. Her body was found naked, save for a necklace or earring still dangling from her ghost white ears. Her car was left abandoned several miles over, wrapped in a stocking mask, was discovered just a couple days later in Romilly, at least 50 miles from the scene of the crime. Bolshaw had been strangled, carefully laid down in a bathtub filled with warm water, face first, and left for her unlucky sister to find the following day. It was October 9th, 1983, and the townsfolk of the Wirral Peninsula were left in utter shock. It was unlike anything anyone had seen in Heswell or beyond. The public reaction matched the weight of the investigation on law enforcement. 85 detectives, nicknamed the Boyfriend Squad, were assigned to the Bolshaw case. Out of 200 to 300 possible suspects named in Bolshaw's extensive address diary, 64 persons of interest were interviewed, 
1,500 statements taken between them and witnesses. For the first 16 years, they led to nowhere, until a random testimony provided the key they needed. In 1999, the friend of John Taft's wife, Barbara Cragg, reported to police a memory she had of Mrs. Taft, revealing John had asked her to create an alibi for him the night of Bolshaw's murder. Taft had been seeing Bolshaw a few weeks prior, telling his wife he was doing contract work on her home, while telling the police he had no contact with the murdered woman at all. Detectives investigated the lead, and John Taft was eventually arrested. Brown fibers found at the scene of the crime, in Bolshaw's car, and at Taft's residence, were all matched, as well as DNA found in a semen sample taken from her negligee. Throughout the entire trial, Taft proclaimed his innocence. He highlighted he'd been an outstanding citizen for the 30 years before the murder, and the 15 years since. His downfall came when another eyewitness stood at the trial, and claimed she saw Taft digging in his backyard the night of the murder, burying the stolen jewellery and the clothes he wore. This combined with a DNA match put him in prison for life. And yet, after his tariff was served, John Taft was released. In an interview with Esquire, he admitted not one member of the prison staff believed he was guilty. He had not an evil bone in his body. When the timeline of the murder was called into question by investigative reporter Timothy Lasley in 2022, even more doubt crept in. If Bolshaw was murdered before midnight on October 8th, how would Taft have killed her, drove her car to Chester High Road, and then home in the pitch black darkness, weighed down with stolen jewellery, and buried his stained shirt also before midnight? Lasley completed the walk herself and said it took more than two hours. The judge at Taft's original trial tried to explain this by suggesting Taft murdered Bolshaw, went back home to bury his clothes, and then returned to the scene of the crime to steal the car. However, this also is impossible, as the brown fibers were found in the car and must have been left before Taft got rid of the evidence. While the DNA evidence is hard to omit from the speculation, it's also possible the semen was a result of Taft's affair with Bolshaw, well before she was strangled to death. The only problem is, the case is closed. No one is, or will ever, be assigned the case again. It's a terrifying thought, thinking a killer still walks the otherwise quirrell streets of the Wirral Peninsula. Tibitha Lasley believes so. As do many followers of the case. Bolshaw had a diary with over 200 names of men she met, and whether they were romantic or not, any one of them could be the culprit. It's possible the real Wirral Strangler resides in that Rolodex of names but horrifyingly enough, will never be privy to such a revelation. The fire that is the beauty in the bath mystery will burn on forever. Zoe, Antrim, Northern Ireland. Our fifth and final story comes from the countryside of Northern Ireland, in the modest civil parish of Antrim, and is the hometown of our much valued patron Zoe. The town's settlement dates back to the Middle Ages, when a small settlement was developed to carry on the ministry of St. Patrick. With its medieval origins, it's no surprise Antrim also comes with a host of castles, and an assortment of hauntings that have since revealed themselves in their ruins. And no haunted castle might be more fascinating than the spirits active at the eponymous lost structure, Antrim Castle itself. Antrim Castle dates back to 1607, when it was owned by Sir Hugh Clotworthy and the Lady Marian. Marian's favourite pastime was long walks across the castle grounds, and most notably the woodlands that surrounded it. Legend goes it was on one of these walks through the woods, Marian came face to face with a snarling wolf, growling and howling at the startled lady. Marian was fortunate her estate was protected by a kennel of Irish wolfhounds, and one just so happened to detect the trouble its owner found herself in. The wolfhound snarled back at the wolf, showing its teeth, preparing for battle. Marian couldn't bear the stress of the attack, and fainted as the two creatures engaged in war. When she finally woke up, the wolf was a bloody heap of bones and fur, the wolfhound injured but alive. Marian and the dog returned to Antrim Castle, where the wolfhound went on to make a full recovery. However, their troubles didn't stop there. A few months later, the wolfhound hero inexplicably disappeared from castle grounds, missing for weeks on end. 
It wasn't until Sir Clotworthy heard his bark from the woodlands that the dog was believed to be alive. Clotworthy put all of his best men on the case, and they investigated the trace of the wolfhound. It was to their shock then, when they ventured into the woods and found a squadron of opposing troops about to launch an attack on Antrim Castle. Thanks again to the dog's heroism, the lives of Marian and Clotworthy were saved. A statue was built in commemoration of the wolfhound, and his spirit was said to protect the castle from that day forward in 1612. Despite the presence of the supernatural dog statue, hauntings were still reported through the next three centuries. One folk tale goes that on May 31st of every year, a coach driven by four horses appears out of thin air, only to disappear into the castle grounds pond. It's said riders in an actual four-horse coach drowned to death at some point in the castle's history, and thus their ghosts return on the anniversary. More phantom happenings were rumoured to exist during the tenure of an aristocrat named Jean Barbara Ainsworth, who assumed ownership of Antrim Castle in 1905 after her marriage to Lord Massarini. Ainsworth once told a publication of her sightings of a man in a pink coat riding a grey horse. The ghostly man wore garb of another era, not resembling the fashion of the early 20th century. Apparently this apparition was visible only to Ainsworth and her dogs, who scared off the man when they approached it. A couple of days later, Ainsworth discovered the man resembled a painting above a Aintrim castle fireplace, depicting a figure in the same pink coat and cavalier hat. She came to find out he was a former owner of the castle and had died on the grounds years before. Another ghost sighting of Ainsworth's included a young girl dressed in grey clothes, popular in the 1730s. However, her relation to the castle was never known, and it's believed the Viscountess fabricated the story to attract intrigued aristocrats to her lavish parties. In fact, it was at one of these parties that Antrim Castle met its tragic end. On the seventh birthday of Ainsworth's son, John, the castle caught fire and burned the entire structure to the ground. A servant called Ethel Gillingham was killed, along with the family's pet cat. The spirit of Gillingham, called the White Lady by Antrim locals, still haunts the ground to this day. Legend also goes that on the morning of the birthday party, the tail to the famous wolfhound statue was broken off, his protection over Antrim Castle no more. We'd love to know, Zoe, if you've ever been to the castle and experienced anything strange whilst there. If we are ever in the area, we'd love to check it out. So that's it for this episode of Too Close to Home. We'd like to say a massive thank you again to the five patrons featured in this video, Morgan, Naresh, Dakota, Dan, and Zoe. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon and allowing us to research these incredible stories within your hometown. Remember everyone, if you want to find out what's lying on your doorstep, head on over to Patreon for more information. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.